All right, so we're going to wrap up today talking about instrumentation. This presentation, we're going to discuss elements of an effective dam safety monitoring program. We're going to describe deformation modeling and methods, sorry, monitoring and methods, also seepage monitoring and methods. We'll go through some advantages and disadvantages of using automation at your project and explain why instrumentation data does not replace your visu uh, visual observations. So a quick pet quote to wrap up the day. Every instrument installed on a project should be selected and placed to assist in answering a specific question. Following this simple rule is the key to a successful field instrumentation. Um, and you can imagine why, and we'll go through that during this presentation. So when we're thinking about our instrumentation programs, we're thinking, what do we need to consider when we're selecting these individual instrumentation devices? What are we needing to include in our overall monitoring program? And those items that we should be thinking through would be site-specific failure modes, um, expected rates of deformations at your project, locations of instruments in relation to project features, uh, of what's going to be useful in some of this monitoring. We're going to think about our visual observations. We're also thinking about maybe where our visual observations are not going to be effective. We'll think about construction activities, um, particularly construction safety, um, also design details and loading history at the project. And those are just a few items. Um, I'm sure people in this room could think of other factors that we're going to consider when we're thinking about the possibility of an instrumentation program. So here are some of the elements of an effective monitoring program, um, things that we're thinking about, identifying our potential failure modes. So how can the project fail? Is Are we um, perhaps looking at an internal erosion related failure mode and what are the risks associated with that failure? Other questions may be um, related to uh, expected deformations again, other types of risks. Um, we'll go through later in the presentation considerations like how fast could a failure mode progress and is this going to be something that could um, help us identify something in progress prior, prior to it going um, too far into that failure mode. Another element of our effective monitoring program is developing that performance monitoring program. So what parameters are we monitoring? What and how many instruments are we going to need to put together this program and get the data that we need? Where should they be located to be effective? How often should we read them? And what are our thresholds of concerns? Once we have established a baseline of data, are, are we going to establish some sort of window that if it goes outside of this bounds, our piezometer reading goes above a certain uh, level for a given reservoir, is this going to trigger something or trigger some sort of action? There are these other elements such as evaluating the overall performance as we're collecting that data and reviewing our monitoring program over time to make sure it's adequate. And we're not going to really talk about that in the, this presentation, um, so we're going to focus on these first two. So first, backing up and thinking as an overall perspective, what parameters can these instruments even monitor at our dam? Um, some of the primary things would include seepage. Uh, we have surficial seepage uh, listed here. Uh, of course, deformation, piezometric pressure, um, so water moving through the structure as opposed to surficial seepage. Um, visual monitoring is critical too, but of course you can't always see what's happening and that's why we rely on our instruments to some degree as well. I should say in addition, not to some degree as if it's not important. Uh, so various instrumentation types and monitored parameters. Um, we'll go through the next section. Uh, we'll look at some of those different instruments that we have available to us and the different parameters that they monitor. And on this image, uh, we can see a small assortment of what may be available for a project. So in this table, uh, on the within the rows, we see different types of uh, potential failure modes that your project may be subjected to. Those related to erosion, such as overtopping, spill erosion, those related to internal erosion, and those related to instability. And across the top of this table, you see um, different elements that we may be able to employ, different instruments. Of course, visual monitoring is going to be one of your uh, primary elements that we're using at any of these projects. And, and any performance monitoring program is the combination of visual monitoring plus your instrument instrumented monitoring. So one does not go without the other. Uh, you can see some other things such as gauges. Um, we have piezometers, relief wells, um, different settlement gauges. And you could go through this table and, and um, postulate 
how some of these instruments are used in terms of those potential failure modes. So that's a reference for you guys to look at later. So first we're gonna talk through deformation monitoring and some of those instruments. And this is not an all encompassing uh, presentation. I do recommend that folks check out, let's see. Well, when I get to it, there's a citation on most of these slides for EM um, 1110 and then the extension is 1908. That's one that I really strongly recommend everybody download or keep as a reference. It was published in November, 2020, so it's pretty up to date. And that's going to go through most of all of the available instrumentation for your dams, how they're used. And it's, uh, like I said, it's, it's pretty up to date in terms of automation and, and other technologies. So when do we monitor for deformation? Well, if we're concerned about internal erosion failure modes leading to stability issues, we wanna be able to see some of those deflections that may be occurring. When we're concerned about settlement or inadequate design height leading to overtopping, we need to know the surveyed height of the top of the structure. That's extremely important. There's many case histories where a failure might've been related to, or an overtopping failure was related to um, an insufficient height. The structure had already settled. Uh, and also when we're concern, concerned about differential settlement, and we'll talk about a few of the instruments that could be used to monitor for differential settlement. Of course, that leads to cracking of your embankment and other issues. A few other ideas, when we're concerned about slope stability, this might be related to uh, rapid drought on effects, long-term loading of an embankment and sorry, long-term loading and embankment saturation, which would result in loss in strength. Um, construction activities, of course, that's our construction safety. Who's worked on a construction site where you had inclinometers installed or maybe even um, LIDAR going, maybe interferometry going? Quite a few folks. So those are, those are definitely very um, effective in a safety measure because as soon as you start seeing certain deflections beyond a threshold, it's time to evacuate staff because they might have a, a slope failure. Um, and then of course, due to riverine erosion. So when we're using the word deformation, we're talking about deformation in, in any uh, orientation. Settlement is often referring to the vertical uh, deformation at your site, and then deflection would be the, the horizontal elements of your deformation. This is a table taken from that EM, there it is, EM um, 1110 to 1908. I really recommend everybody flag that if you just enter Google that EM number, you'll be able to pull it up and save it. Um, so these are categories of instruments for measuring the location or magnitude of deformation. And in this presentation, we're really just going to look at some of the ones that are circled in red. Um, the ones that are circled, that are not circled, those are primarily for a concrete structure. Um, and then in this table, it indicates the type of deformation that we're monitoring, be it horizontal, vertical, surficial, or subsurface. Um, so of course, we have our survey monuments. Most of us are very familiar with those at the surface. The other ones that we'll mention are subsurface instruments. So of course our surface movement points, I think most of us are quite familiar with those. We probably have seen them on our projects if you have um, been out on any of our dam sites. Um, this is a surface monument. It's a fairly shallow installation and it is going to be surveyed by a number of devices. Here is just a, a, a whole list of different things that could be used to monitor those survey monuments. One of the important things is to make sure that you're doing a consistent method. If traditionally those surface monuments are always read by uh, optical leveling, make sure that you continue to do that method until you have perhaps rebaselined and correlated it over to maybe an updated method if you are doing that. Um, you don't want to change methods because you will, you, you know, we're looking at perhaps very, very small movements and the, the small amount of error between different methods could result in a, some sort of, um, false sense of movement or lack of movement potentially. And this is what a plot may look like when you are plotting the data for your surface monuments. This is from Fall Creek Lake. And again, we're looking at a vertical movement um, at the surface of the structure. Um, here they have been plotting the surface, the survey data for looks like many, many, many years. Um, and, and it's hard to see, but these type these deflections are on the order of 0.15 inches, or sorry, 0.15 feet um, that the project has settled along the center line. So you're using that to evaluate, you're looking for low spots. If you've done a risk analysis, you've probably been asked that question. What's your most recent survey data? Did it indicate any low spots along the alignment of the project? 
Um, you're also looking in this plot for anything that is quite irregular because it could be the sign of differential settlement. Here you do see that one location um, has had additional settlement perhaps relative to the other locations. It would need to be looked at and perhaps evaluated by the team. Surface monuments can also be used to measure deflection. So that plot, of course, was our vertical movement. And this is a plot showing the horizontal deflection um, from the dam center line. We can see uh, in the plot on the right that there has been some degree of downstream movement. Um, it says upstream, actually. It might be in the upstream direction. Um, along this, these positions on the embankment center line station. This could also show that if there's like a particular zone of interest, if there's a perhaps a zone that's been creeping and uh, one section of your embankment is, is deflecting in a certain direction. So now we're moving into subsurface deformation monitoring. Um, the first item and probably the most simplistic that we'll talk about are settlement platforms. These are installed as your embankment is being constructed and it measures total settlement. Um, from the location of where that plate is installed um, to where the instrument is monitored. Again, it's installed um, prior to embankment construction or during embankment construction. And um, a few notes here, the riser pipe can sometimes interfere with construction activities. Um, you're trying to compact your embankment dam, you want to run your equipment, and there's a riser pipe you have to work around. Um, so there would be considerations when using something like this. Um, essentially, you're adding sections of pipe, you're screwing on the next section, be a 5, 10 foot section, if not more, um, as you're bringing the embankment up. So it's a, it's a very simplistic construction. Another type of uh, similar device would be a boros anchor. This is something that's more suitable for a soft clay. Uh, when this instrument is installed, you can see at the bottom of the figure, there's these extended prongs. These are deployed into the clay, and then it's seated at that interval. Um, so again, as your structure may be settling, it's showing the, the settlement relative to the location where the instrument is deployed, so where those prongs. So the prong is, is set out at a at perhaps a depth of 10, 20 feet from the surface of your embankment. Um, you're getting settlement measurements from that, lo that location. A probe extensometer is constructed a little bit different. This is going to be something that is founded all the way into your firm foundation. Um, so you have a suitable base. And there's different types of probe, uh, different types of extensometers. Um, it might be a metal device, there's magnetic devices. Um, but uh, no matter what the configuration is, it allows for a, a reading to be taken, <laughs> excuse me, um, by, <laughs> Um, sorry, I think I messed something up. No, okay. Um, it allows various readings to be taken, and you're looking for any net movement of these locations where the ring is installed. Um, there's some sort of reference ring, and again, there's there's several different configurations where it could be uh, different materials that are used, um, and you're measuring for the net um, distances and deflections um, between these rings as the, the footing is secured into the foundation. This is another image of an array of settlement points. Um, in this type of setup, you do have the benefit of being able to monitor many points within your embankment with one borehole installation. Embedded extensometers, um, these provide a, a more focused or more localized look at movements. They're installed in a horizontal trench. They measure extension or contraction. Um, they're typically installed parallel to the embankment access. Um, the purpose of this is to reveal fill sections that have um, experienced enough differential se uh, settlement to potentially induce cracking. Um, so these type of devices may be installed in locations where you have a concern due to maybe the foundation slope is changing abruptly, or there's an area that is compressible and you want to monitor for the, the potential for differential settlement. I encourage you to read up on all these devices for more information. And again, all of this is coming from EM 1908. So if you are charged with instrumentation considerations or installations, this would be a great reference to start with. Um, so now we're looking at inclinometers. So we're thinking of a little bit of a different type of deformation, um, whereas we were looking before at more settlement um, type items. Uh, 
An inclinometer is used to monitor lateral deformations in uh, earth, rock, whatever it may be. This can be installed deep into foundations. It also can be installed in your embankments um, at various steps. So again, this might be where we're interested. We have a concern about an existing land landslide that the project was constructed on. Um, we're concerned about something with the embankment. Maybe we already have reason to think that there has been some sort of deformation, and now we're going to go and install an inclinometer. This might be related to excavations or construction safety. Frequently, you will see inclinometers installed around an excavation site during construction. Uh, slurry walls, sheep house, and there's, there's many more examples we could give for why we would have interest, and in especially watching for certain zones of deformation and deflection. Inclinometers can be read uh, manually or they can be automated. Um, so we have the manual versus fixed in place inclinometers. So again, that inclinometer is giving us an idea of horizontal displacement distribution with depth. And on the left of this figure, we see two examples of what an inclinometer plot could look like. It could look like a lot of things, but these are just two examples. Um, in this far left figure, we see an example where the material is bulging in a certain location, and this could be due to instability at that spot, at that depth. Um, maybe this is in an abutment and there's a slide that's of concern, or maybe it's in an embankment and we have um, a bulging effect, perhaps of a slide impending. Um, on the right of, in the center of this overall figure, we see an example of overall relaxation and tilt, and we don't see anything um, you know, that is differential along this linear trend. Things are sort of moving together. Um, this far right graphic is a image of a typical inclinometer installation. Um, there's, a, there's some really great images online too, if you wanted to take a look. Um, primary things to think of, uh, when you're installing an inclinometer, it will be a, a, a cylinder tube that has four grooves in it. And those grooves are going to be oriented um, in the direction of your expected deformation. So these need to be labeled very clearly, though, because when you go with your instrument, you'll have these will be numbered or labeled. You, you need to tell the instrument what grooves you're collecting in. Am I collecting in the, say, north-south orientation or the east-west orientation? Um, I've definitely seen data come back from inclinometer reading where it's confusing, and you're looking, and you've been monitoring a trend, and now things are all over the place. And often what that means is that the person reading the instrument inadvertently had a, qu a quarter rotated. So in the computer, when it says I'm logging the north-south orientation, in reality, they had it in the east-west grooves and vice versa. So be very, very mindful. And if you're getting instrumentation data that doesn't make sense, that's one of the first places to start because it's a very, very common error, and I've, I've seen it a lot. Uh, so be mindful for them. Uh, here are some images of, of what those devices look like. Um, I think, who here has done an inclinometer reading? Okay, we're very experienced here. So people know what this equipment looks like. Normally these readings are taken every about two feet if you're doing a manual reading. It takes a long time. So don't expect this to be a, a fast field day if you have a very deep inclinometer um, to read. Okay, so here's an example of uh, the installation diagram for a in-place inclinometer. This would be your more automated. Um, what the figure is showing is uh, the, I forgot what these sensors are called, uh, the, the servo accelerometers, but essentially you have a, a string of sensors about every two feet um, that are left in place in this inclinometer. Um, so the reading can be just taken from the surface. You're not actually dropping your manual device in and pulling it out every single time. And, and typically when you're reading the, these inclinometers, you're going to lower the device to the bottom and you're taking the readings as you're pulling it out. So pull it two feet, click, take a reading. Pull it two feet, click, take a reading. That's why it takes a long time. Um, with this, this is left in place. Um, individual tilt sensors is the word I was looking for. So all these sensors are down the hole. Um, you only have to go to the surface to take the reading. It can save you time. It's just a more expensive uh, startup cost. So now we're going to move into seepage monitoring and instrumentation. And why do we monitor seepage? Well, it's one of the leading causes of embankment dam failures. And it's, it's very vital that we know exactly how water is being controlled and conveyed at our project. Because dams are going to seep, but it's up to us to make sure that that seepage is safe. Uh, we monitor the project for 
risk driving internal erosion related failure modes by using some of this instrumentation. Of course, inter internal erosion can lead to all sorts of failure modes. We're already aware of most, most of these. Um, here's the end image again of some of those internal erosion potential failure modes. Uh, we could cite case histories for most of these uh, of how they have left or uh, led to um, embankment dam failures. Unfortunately, uh, a well thought out instrumentation program may be effective of giving us an idea of when things are becoming a concern. Not always, but in an ideal world. Uh, so a little bit on measuring seepage. Um, of course, we're going to be talking about superficial seepage. We're also going to be talking about seepage through the structure. So exiting seepage passing through, around, and under your water impounding embankment should be monitored. Uh, measuring that seepage for turbidity and sediment is also extremely important at all stages of your construction, first filling, any modifications you do with the structure, and just throughout the life of the project. Um, of course, that's going to be one of our first signs of, of something is definitely not going right if you're seeing sediment in that seepage water. Seepage that emerges at the downstream or landward side of an embankment is typically collected um, by a variety of devices. And here we list relief wells, drainage outlets, open channels, weirs and flumes, and we'll go through just a few of those here. Um, so first, starting with weirs, there's three primary types of weirs that may be installed. V-notches are when we have uh, quite low seepage flows um, from less than one CFS to about 10 CFS. How many folks have taken readings from a V-notch weir? Yep. So a lot of times you might have a table or some sort of chart that will correlate um, the height in your V-notch weir to the, the flow. We also have rectangular and trapezoidal flow uh, uh, weirs. Um, these both are for monitoring greater than 10 CFS generally. Rectangular are considered to have a little bit better accuracy. The seepage rates are then determined by measuring the distance from the overall overflow crest to the upstream pool surface. So that's just saying the height of the water as it's overtopping the weir. Uh, ways that we may take that measurement might be by stash stop gauge. And all of these instruments will generally always have that gauge, even if we do have some, maybe an automated or a higher level of, of reading, like here we show um, sonic transducers, um, accelerometers. Um, even if you have something that is fancier and perhaps purpose for automation, you should always still see that staff gauge, make sure it's accurate, make sure your tiles aren't missing um, because it's always your backup. And again, these items would be referenced to tables, software applications, or, or other items. Uh, so flumes, similar to weirs, are also constructed to monitor an open channel flow. Um, flumes work by constricting the flow as it, uh, as it travels through a certain location, and it's used to um, generate that differential head that can then be related to a flow rate. And again, the methods of water level monitoring here is the same as in weirs. Um, there are three types of flumes. You've probably all heard of the partial flumes or cutthroat, trapezoidal. And comparing the two, uh, flumes are less, um, they offer a less abrupt constriction than a weir. Um, they expend less of the weir head. Um, it does allow for sediment and debris to pass through the flume location. Um, they can be more expensive. Of course, by letting our sediment pass through, it takes away the opportunity for us to check for the possibility of sediment being eroded. Um, so for that, in a lot of dam safety applications, we do prefer use of a weir because that will trap sediment and allow it to drop off. Oh, next, that's where it says right there. Weirs are prefer preferred for our seepage flow as an embankment because it actually traps our sediment and allows us to monitor for that. Um, some things to think about when you're designing weirs as part of your embankment dam, this is going to be something that will inevitably be included in your design. Um, is it adequate length and width of a stilling basin to, to handle the amount of flow that's coming through? Um, am I going to be able to prevent blockage and other types of weir submersion. All these photos are of weirs that have gone wrong. Um, is also, is it going to be protected from freezing and leakage? You also want to consider things like rainfall infiltration and critters. You can see that on one of these images, there is a gate um, at the, the discharge point. Um, that's to keep all sorts of things out of your, maybe a tow drain system. 
uh, a little bit more on weirs and flume measurement methods. Here you can see we, this is a great example of a transducer being used probably for automation. This is in a drainage gallery, um, but they still have their staff gauge uh, readily visible on the wall. It's in, it's in good visual, you know, working order um, because those transducers might fail, batteries may die, but you still have your working staff gauge. Again, this is a, here's an example of a V notch, and then we have a direction of flow. Um, so visual gauges, pressure transducers are not uncommon, especially in areas that are a little bit more difficult to go and take a reading. Also, we'll go through this a little bit later, but we consider using automation in projects where we have a lot of risk or um, is something that's going to be extremely important uh, to a failure mode that could progress rapidly, perhaps. Or maybe this is just a high-risk project and we're automating all of our instruments. There's a few other examples, buoyant float devices and then other types of radar measurements. The most basic method, though, of measuring seepage through your weir or flume is to pull out a bucket and a stopwatch. I'm assuming everybody here has done that. Bucket and stopwatch method. I sure have. All right. That's the, the oldest trick in the book. You fill up a bucket of a known quantity, say a five gallon bucket, and you time how long it takes to fill it up. And then you get your, you get a discharge. Here's an example of um, some sort of um, constructed feature. Um, maybe it, this is a, um, some sort of underground structure it looks like from the photo. Um, but in here we see an automated instrument. There's an automated reader down at the bottom. We also still see our staff gauge. You can see the pipe, uh, perhaps where the flows are, are entering, or actually it's pretty close to the bottom. That might be the discharge pipe um, for readings that are passing through this um, probably underground weir. Uh, so seepage manhole, this is probably a, a great example of something like that, although there's a lot of light coming from the surface, so maybe they opened a, a very large opening. Um, if this is a little bit small on this figure, um, but there's there are many sources for design details of a seepage manhole. Essentially, you have flow that is able to enter. Perhaps this is flow that's been collected from your tow drain and uh, or, or anything else. It's some sort of seepage collection system. It enters the this manhole. There's going to be a V-notch or rectangular type of weir within the, within the box. I have my staff gauge. Um, this is where water is overtopping my weir. And, I'm, and then I have an outflow pipe. Um, this might be a great opportunity. This might be cumbersome to get down into this manhole. This might be a great spot to put in a pressure transducer to monitor uh, the flow through this device. Uh, so when we are looking at seepage weirs and flumes, uh, we might portray the data in a time history plot, or we might be correlating it to some other variable. And that's what both of these plots look like. Here we see a time history plot very cyclical. This is probably uh, annual reservoir rise and fall. Um, on the right here, we see that it has been correlated to reservoir. So on our y-axis, we're plotting our seepage flow value. And on the, oh, this one actually, I take that back. They put reservoir on the y-axis and seepage flow on the x-axis. Um, so regardless, we're correlating the flow, the seepage flow to the reservoir, and we can see quite a linear relationship. Be mindful that it's not always going to be a linear relationship if you're plotting this data. You might need to, especially if you're going to go ahead and click Excel, go ahead and add my linear interpolation line. Um, be mindful if you need to break out data sets. Sometimes you would have a more complex seepage collection system where part of it doesn't become engaged until a higher elevation, and suddenly you'll see um, a rate change and that seepage discharge based on however your system is set up. Sometimes if you have relief wells, um, there might be different elevations uh, for that collection system. Um, so just be mindful, be aware of your project, um, and don't be alarmed if it's designed to see an inflection point of that rate of seepage discharge increase at a certain reservoir elevation. Uh, reading frequencies, this is just a reminder, make sure that you are picking the appropriate reading frequency. Um, we can see uh, there's a plot where this has been automated. We had very frequent, it looks like nearly daily readings uh, versus someone going out and maybe taking a visual observation every two months. Uh, we've missed a lot of potential data. We missed the spike, um, perhaps from a, there was a heavy precipitation event. Um, 
but just be aware of what's going to be suitable for your project. And if there's a particular interest for a certain monitoring period, it might be a great time to put some automation in. Automation is frequently used temporary when there's a certain application, like we're going to go out and we're going to be doing drilling or test pitting. So I'm going to automate instruments that aren't normally automated by dropping in a temporary transducer um, so that I can monitor for any changes in the subsurface while I'm doing those activities, or maybe construction or a repair. Okay, so now we're going to talk about piezometric levels. So we were talking about surf, surf, surface seepage, and now we're going to talk about subsurface. So why do we monitor piezometric levels? Well, there's a lot of different reasons. This is not an encompassing list. Some great examples might be, I've just finished construction on my brand new embankment. It's beautiful. Um, I want to measure the dissipation of the construction-induced pore water, excess pore water pressures. You should see that nice... Uh, uh, asymptotic type curve as it goes down. Uh, we might be checking for change in flows in or near our internal drains, looking for leakage possibly associated with a concrete structure, um, just monitoring the general saturation levels in our abutment or certain locations in the embankments. We want to verify that our downstream shells remain isolated from the pool, and Greg brought that point up earlier, talking about how he has set bezometers um, proximate to certain filtered zones to make sure that the filter is not being overwhelmed and is still conveying the water safely. We're looking at foundation pressures, um, embankment pressures. We might be looking at all sorts of different layers within the foundation. You often will see an area of nested piezometers that will have um, some instruments installed in the foundation, maybe there's overburden materials left in place, and then different zones within the embankment. And a note on nested piezometers, in the 80s or, or certain times, you know, before recently, you might have seen a lot of times instruments installed in the same drill holes. They, they had a six or eight inch drill hole and they stuck maybe two or three piezometers down the same hole to target different elevations. Um, so the first one might have been installed in the foundation and the next one in that overburden material and the next one up in the embankment. And that's no longer considered a best practice. We don't, we don't want to be doing that. If you need to set a nested array, because I, this is the location of interest, maybe it's at the crest near a critical station, we still want to offset those holes to some degree um, to cut down the chance of communication between um, the different transducers that would be installed. Um, so typically we'd offset five to 10 feet, depending on the, the depth of your hole, uh, to put in that next piezometer for the coincident location. So how is our piezometric level data used? And this is only, a, again, a small example of all the different uses. Um, we're monitoring the water flow pattern. We're getting an idea of how water is moving through our structure. It allows us to determine groundwater conditions prior to construction and then during and after construction. We monitor the seepage pressure distribution. We're determining the effectiveness of our drains, relief wells, seepage barriers. Often, if you do have a lot of relief wells installed at your project, you're going to have a lot of coincident piezometers in the area as well, so you can monitor how they're doing. Your relief well has been installed to lower that uh, phreatic surface in those locations, perhaps um, to reduce your blowout or heave risk. So uh, the piezometer is going to allow you to monitor exactly where those levels are. It also provides a soil strength index. Um, measuring pore water pressure allows you to estimate the effect of stress um, in soil strength. And you guys have talked about effective stress already, but here's just an example of um, you know, looking at our stratigraphy and once we have the phreatic surface, what the total stress versus effective stress looks like with depth. We already saw this chart. This is just a reminder, uh, thinking about how piezometer data can be vital to determining the various internal erosion mechanisms potentially affecting the site. When we saw this chart or this before, we were thinking of surface seepage, and now we're thinking of the through embankment, the embankment into foundation, or the through foundation types of failure modes. Thinking things like Teton, there's some pretty famous failures. Fontanelle was a near failure. There's a great presentation, if you ever see it, uh, called The Race to Save Fontanelle. And it, it's almost like one of those presentations that keeps you on the edge of your seat. Uh, I found it fascinating. It was a reclamation dam that would have failed, it should have failed, but they saved it in the nick of time only because they lowered the reservoir in time. All of their defensive measures that they were taking, dumping any rip wrapper material they could into the, the growing void, none of it was going to be effective. That dam was going to fail if they didn't get the reservoir down in time, which is why Teton did fail, because they could not get the reservoir down in time. Um, so on this slide, we're looking at observation wells versus piezometers. Observation wells are completely open. So if 
my sanding interval is the entire length of my drill hole. So I'm not isolating any of these pervious zones. I'm allowing an, an average groundwater level to be read. Versus a piezometer, I'm targeting a certain zone. I have sanded my interval only for my location of interest, and everything else is backfilled with something like bentonite. Um, typically, we'll do at least a three-foot bentonite seal, and we can continue with grout after that. We do want to put bentonite up against the sand because you don't want the grout to infiltrate down into that sand you just placed. If these are going to be open stand pipes, you do not want grout to get down into your screen. Once you get beyond that bentonite seal, then it, grout is generally okay above that point. Um, you do need surface seals uh, for environmental reasons. You definitely don't want um, some spill at the surface to travel down your piezometer down into a layer that's much deeper in the, the water system. So a little more on piezometers. The purposes, of course, we're measuring our piezometric levels. And by using the term piezometric, we're talking about that targeted zone. Our instrument is targeted to a certain strata of interest, and it's potentially below a confining unit um, within the embankment and the foundation. And we're measuring the phreatic surface within our embankment in other cases. There's various types, and you guys have probably all heard these words, our standpipes, porous tube. I'll talk a little bit about porous tubes in a second. Um, some items that if you see, you should immediately think of a few things would be hy um, hydraulic piezometers and pneumatic piezometers. Those are not used anymore, but you will find them on older projects. But don't specify them for any of your new embankment designs. Um, they generally were set up in arrays, and so one network, um, there'd be a whole system of tubes, and maybe down at the downstream side, you'd walk into a, a, a box, you could open up, or sometimes they're just exposed in this box, and there's all sorts of dials that each tube leads to, and they were it, it's a whole array of instruments that um, were read using hydraulic pressure, pressures or pneumatic pressures. Um, there's a lot of concerns with those systems. Often they have now been associated with the potential for internal erosion. Uh, these arrays would be continuous tubes upstream to downstream in your dam at all sorts of elevations. Um, and as they died, they failed, they're impossible to rehab. You would just see them X'd out on a drawing, like over time, more and more X'd out that they've completely failed. You can go and try and flush them out and get them working again, but it rarely works. Um, it's not something we would recommend anymore. It actually poses dam safety risk. You'll, you'll see this generally excluded. It's a very, very low generally um, risk, but, but it's something we recognize as a bad practice now. Um, there's also vibrating wire, and we'll talk about those fully grouted vibrating wire piezometers. Does anyone know the word for what's happening in this photo on the right? What word you'd use to describe water squirting out the top of your piezometer? Artesian. Yep. Um, when you have a piezometer that's not set up to be an artesian piezometer, but it has turned into an artesian piezometer, you can, there's different attachments you can use to, to capture the pressure. All right, so measuring our piezometric pressure. Piezometers, again, come in all shapes and sizes. Um, there's definitely opinions about all of these. Open standpipes are what you're going to generally see and probably install at your projects. Uh, there can be slotted screen piezometers, or they use the word Norton tip. Um, you'll often hear like porous tube, porous stone. Uh, those are not as recommended as they were in the past because it makes well development extremely difficult. Um, I'm looking to develop my sand filter pack and, and get my well um, clean after construction, and that porous tube is going to restrict the movement of fines um, up and out of the hole as you're trying to develop it. Slotted screens then with a filter compatible screen size to your sand filter pack around it are going to probably be a, a good recommended installation for something that is not going to perhaps receive automation. It could later. You could retrofit this with a transducer. There's also fully grouted. Um, this is a special uh, specialized installation technique. Research is underway, but I think there has been a lot of acceptance in the community to pursue these fully grouted vibrating wire piezometers, which is essentially you have your drill hole and you're going to tape your transducer cable along the side of your a trummy PVC pipe. Um, the transducer would be at the bottom of your pipe. You're going to lower that all the way to the bottom of your drill hole. Um, that PVC pipe is going to be sacrificial and you're going to use that to trummy grout and you're going to fully grout up the borehole, including the transducer in place. And I remember when I'm first reading about these, I'm so skeptical. I'm thinking, how on earth is the water pressure going to reach the transducer in any timely fashion if it's fully grouted, especially you're using a low permeability grout? And they say, yeah, that's great. Use a low permeability grout. Because in fact, uh, it would almost be preferred. You might have transducers 
applied to your pipe at all sorts of elevations, giving you a truly nested piezometer. Um, in reality, the research shows that I think the number is um, two to the negative five milliliters of water is all that's needed to convey the seepage pressure through that grout in those locations. And I'm sure that is based on with a star, an asterisk next to it saying the borehole must be this diameter and, and all those sort of factors. And I'm, I'm sure it also correlates to a certain permeability of grout. But uh, the, the point being that research shows that these are very effective. And if you're interested in looking at these on your project, they are considered viable. Um, definitely take a look. There's a lot of resources out there for the installation of fully grouted vibrating wire piezometers. Oh, one let's see. Oh, this one just mentions legacy systems don't do this, pneumatic and hydraulic. Uh, so here are some images of vibrating wire piezometer tips and what those transducers look like. And this is an image of a fully grouted system. Um, here, let's see, we have two, looks like we have two transducers installed in this system and uh, they're fully grouted. Um, again, it, it definitely took me reading about this a little bit to not feel so skeptical, but um, the research is out there that this is an effective system. So different water level data collection methods, um, we might go out and read it manually. Who here has used the slope indicator uh, manual reader? Yeah, I think we've all used one of those. The geologists at one of my jobs, we all just had them in our cars at all times. You never, you know, reading our drill hole at the beginning of drilling, the evening. Um, it, it's a very simple device. You lower the probe and it sounds a buzzer when it encounters water generally. And then you're able to read off the tape uh, that depth to water. Some other items, this would be a transducer system. Um, and again, transducers might be installed permanently. Also, we sometimes use them temporarily. I've, I've definitely worked on projects where we are doing something um, and we want to temporarily uh, install a transducer in the hole. You might go out five days prior to your planned activity to really make sure you have a good baseline and you understand maybe daily fluctuations in the well or, or any other fluctuations. If, um, greater than five days may be great, um, but that allows you to maybe set a very high frequency of reading while you're doing whatever the planned activity may be. Um, again, like it could be an excavation. Um, of course, if you're going to do some sort of pump out test related to a permeability application, maybe I need to design a dewatering system. This would be a great opportunity to go drop pressure trans transducers in all of your available wells. Maybe you drilled some new wells um, just for this test. And then last, we see pressure gauges. And a lot of times this might be for um, maybe an artesian condition or some other specialized application. You'll see these in drainage galleries. Um, you might also see these um, pressure gauges installed on wells in artesian zones. Uh, here's an example of piezometer data that has been plotted as a time history. Um, so we see large reservoir fluctuations and, and little piezometer fluctuations. In this particular plot, um, you could apply these type of fluctuations as a, you know, how much uh, variation in my piezometer data is there compared to the overall variation reservoir data, um, convey that as a percentage. Um, to me, it's a lot easier to plot these on an X and Y axis, which I'll show that next. Um, so we're looking at this highly responsive. That would be perhaps if on your time history, you would see something that's following much closer. So even like a 50% fluctuation with the reservoir would be a slope of 0.5. Um, so in this case, we have reservoir plotted on the Y axis and Nope, I got that backwards again. I'm so sorry. Piezometer plotted on the y-axis and our pool always plotted on the x-axis. Um, and we're looking at that response. And you're able to pull the, the slope of your curve of this linear interpolation to give you an idea about the response to the reservoir. Um, this is an example of a not very responsive uh, instrument. So even as the pool is rising, 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 this instrument's not responding. Either it responds to something else or it's in a location that's very impermeable. Um, sometimes you might need to also check things like tailwater. You might find, and, and generally what you would see though is a lot of scatter, but scatter that is not associated with your uh, reservoir. Um, however, you might go and compare that to your tailwater elevation and see it lines up very, very well. So it's lining up with your outlet works releases and not with the reservoir. Beware also of um, certain scatter that might actually indicate the lag time. So let's look at this chart right here where uh, 
as the reservoir is rising, the piezometer is rising. Sometimes the reservoir might have risen two days ago, but that instrument is still trying to rise, so you'll see a point anomalously low. But if you'd waited another week and this reservoir has been stabilized at that elevation, eventually it's going to reach its equilibrium at the curve location. That means that also the reservoir drops, uh, we've made a big release perhaps, and you go out only a couple days later, and even though the reservoir has already dropped to this level, our instrument has not dropped yet. And we're going to have to let the reservoir remain stable for that instrument to re-reach its equilibrium. Um, so if you see a lot of scatter, scatter in the plot, it might be worth, you could test, you could look for a hysteresis about the curve um, that would rely on perhaps a lot more frequent readings. But then you would know that um, you would be looking for this actual trend relationship to follow where the instrument would have reached its new equilibrium. equilibrium. Um, and the scatter doesn't necessarily mean that there's poor correlation. It's an indication of the permeability of the material and the lag time for that instrument to respond to the reservoir. Uh, so here's an example. You go into a risk analysis, and the question is, you know, I have a lot of doubts about this cutoff trench excavation. They excavated the cutoff trench. They tied it into a grout cap that goes up the abutment. Um, but we have these green areas on the dam. We have a lot of green areas in the desert and areas around the dam. We don't think our cutoff trench is effective. We think the foundation is conveying seepage. Um, so I scour through all the instrumentation data, and I discover that with this, uh, there's a sandy zone left in place downstream of the trench that I have instruments that are installed in that sandy zone. I want to see if these are responding to the reservoir. And sure enough, when I did that, I look at you know, various reservoir elevations. I see that this instrument that's located in the left in place of, um, overburden material immediately downstream of the cutoff trench is responding pretty reliably to the reservoir. At this location, much further downstream, I am not seeing reservoir response. I do see a lot of scatter. And in fact, when I go and I plot this against tailwater, I found that that instrument just might fall as tailwater. Um, but this does tell me that there's likely something going on. In this case, we determined actually to be wraparound seepage through the abutment um, because of the uh, grout cap not completely cutting off those rock discontinuities um, versus the, the likelihood of it going underneath this cutoff trench, where they did very good foundation treatment at the bottom of that cutoff trench. But just an idea of critical questions that might rise, uh, might come up during uh, risk analysis or other type of evaluation of your structure and how instrumentation can be beneficial for them. Okay, so a few other types of instruments that we'll touch on briefly. Um, these won't be things that you deal with as much. Stress cells, uh, these aren't used as much anymore. You might have seen this more in the past. This is also something that would be more of interest to underground construction, tunnels, underground stadiums if you live in Norway, which I still think is really cool that they constructed an entire huge stadium completely underground. It blows my mind. So these are earth pressure cells. They measure the internal stresses within the embankment or the foundation. They might be installed against a surface. Um, they are completely embedded within a soil mass. Um, the orientation of the stress it's reading is, is set at its installation, so these devices would have to be oriented for whatever direction you want your more circle to, to read the stresses. Um, an example of what that plot might be looking like would be um, uh, this is a this is time in years, so 1984, 1985 on the x-axis. Here I see the elevation of my fill-in reservoir on this left vertical axis and on the right vertical axis. Here's my earth pressure, which is shown by this line. So I see that my earth pressure is rising and rising pretty in line with how the fill is being brought up. Um, I see no changes in earth pressure at this location when the reservoir comes up years later. Um, typically, this would not be used for a um, detection of an issue. It's more confirmation of design and maybe improving future designs. Seismographs, we all know what those are. Um, if your project is in a seismically active area, there's a chance that you have a seismograph at your project or you're going to have to um, add that into your design. You're going to consult with your favorite seismology friend or geologist on that one. Uh, again, measuring earth earthquake ground motions, it's great to have them at the site because you can see how the dam feels ground motion at different locations within the dam. Because just because uh, your ground motion is, is attenuating through the ground, maybe the bedrock or if you have deep overburden, um, that attenuation relationship at the dam is going to be very unique for every structure. And it's, it's something that's very difficult to monitor 
or to model when it comes to the deformation, deformation modeling associated with um, seismic hazards. So that, yeah, that site-specific data is, is pretty, is extremely important when it comes to doing a, looking at the site-specific seismic hazard at your project. Uh, you might see digital accelerographs. Here are some photos. You also, especially if you're out on a project in a seismically active area, you probably have seen something that looks like this before. I've definitely seen this on many projects. I don't often get to go inside those boxes, though. They're locked and mysterious. They keep the riffraff out, like the geologists, seismologists only. Anyways, that's typical housing for a seismograph. Um, the last thing I'm going to talk about is automated data acquisition systems, ADIS, or we often just call it automation. And again, um, with the recent update to EM 1110 to 1908, there's a whole section on ADIS now, and I, I recommend checking it out if you want to familiarize yourself. Um, so this is an image showing what a, a total system could look like, and these would be all the different elements that we might consider. And there's other elements as well that are not included in this figure, but it's pretty encompassing. Uh, we might have an array of instruments at our project. They might be brought to a central housing. This might be the host-driven network. If it's connected, I'm oh, sorry, this would be our node-driven network. If it's connected elsewhere, say um, by telephone um, or it's connected by satellite, a lot of times we use telemetry and cell phone towers. I think there's a cell phone tower on this. I think they just use the word internet communication. Uh, maybe that's, a, I don't know. Self, oh, there it is. There's a the cellular tower right here. Those are all different ways of conveying that data. Um, there's all sorts of systems. It's changing all the time. This is evolving technology um, that we're able to get that automated instrument reading directly to the host-driven network, wherever it may be. They show a district office here. Um, or perhaps things are wired directly to the project office and then somehow conveyed electronically to another office. Um, you have to work through security protocols if you're dealing with this type of automation. Um, so definitely consult with districts or other entities that have already gone through this. Um, automation is definitely encouraged in a lot of situations. If you have a very high-risk facility, if you have a failure mode of interest that could be caught, but it's going to move rapidly, you may want to set up instrumentation with triggering type of um, uh, results for certain threshold exceedance. Um, here's some photos that you might see at a site if you do have automation. This is one of the devices that perhaps we would not always recommend for installation. Um, this type of device shows uh, you have your housing. This is a picture of inside that box of all of the cool gizmos and gadgets. Um, we see solar panels that keep this thing charged. There is a little bit of lightning protection. Um, and this might be a box that we're sending out somebody, maybe from the project office or an O&M personnel, to the site to manually download that data from this box, which means if a hurricane hits and blows the tower, this, this box away, lightning strikes it, you might have lost all data from the last time you downloaded it. Um, these things are, are definitely potentially unreliable if they're not connected to a, a host automatically. Um, so while it, it could be great as a temporary solution, these aren't often long-term solutions because they love to get hit by lightning, they might be vandalized, um, there's all sorts of things that can happen, and then you lose all readings um, if they haven't been backed up in some amount of time. So some advantages and disadvantages. Well, a huge advantage is you get frequent data collection. You can set it to as, as frequent as you want. You could have every second for some of these devices if you wanted to. Uh, you get to collect and evaluate data at remote locations that would otherwise be read very infrequently. You can get real-time data evaluation at any time, and that's great for construction monitoring or anything that poses a safety risk. And again, it's very efficient. All I have to do is log into my computer potentially and look at the live data. Some of the disadvantages, it can be costly to maintain and to install. Um, you could see interruptions due to weather or lost power, and that's even if you have it connected to a host-driven network, uh, the power is out, whatever it may be, cell phone towers are down. You, you are going to lose um, that relay. Um, challenging assessing, or challenges assessing the data for its accuracy. Um, there's potentially some false readings that are going to be a little bit more difficult to troubleshoot. And potential complacency. Well, it's, it's read this, and nobody's gone out to manually verify. Perhaps you have been getting a false reading. 
But overall, there's a lot of advantages, and this is definitely a system to familiarize yourself with and to learn about um, as the technology is evolving, especially on new designs. This might be something that is very suitable for your projects. Um, here's an image of, of what you might be have access to on your computer screen. Um, we see a list of instruments. Uh, here I'm looking at all of the current readings. This is a live feed of instrumentation data. Um, there are thresholds. I could go into each of these instruments and, and see what the threshold might be. Um, if this is something that responds to reservoir, you could have it set with that linear interpolation equation. So uh, when reservoir equals blank, my range and the piezometer value should be equal to um, whatever that range may be that you set, uh, given the linear response of the instrument. Final thoughts. Things to consider, just remember, when you're looking at your instrumentation program or anything that you're installing or evaluating, think about the reservoir elevations and how it's going to vary. Think about precipitation, seasonal changes, and how that's going to impact um, your instrumentation program and the ability to monitor it. Just think about time in general. Instrumentation data does not replace visual observations and do not rely on it as such. It only supplements your visual observation program. And on visual monitoring, we have another Ralph Peck quote, and we love Peck quotes. An instrument tool often overlooked in our technical world is the human eye connected to the brain of an intelligent human being. So don't forget that. That might be your first line of defense that something's wrong at your project and kicking it into some sort of non-routine study um, could be a visual observation accompanied with instrumented observations. Your visual monitoring program should always include routine inspections, flood monitoring, camera inspections. Um, you'll have your dam tenders on site, often the most knowledgeable of what's happening at the site, and observations by the public. Um, many, many problems. The, the case history of A.V. Watkins, a internal erosion failure mode in progress, was caught by a member of the public who called and said, hey, there's a bunch of, there's a bunch of sediment in my drainage ditch by my farm. Is that supposed to happen? No. There was a big backward erosion pipe that was moving through the dam and moving a lot of material out. Um, so in summary, these are things that we learned to set at the beginning, but there's many elements. We talked about deformation monitoring. We talked about seepage monitoring. Remember, collection of instrumentation data may be automated, which allows for a lot of great things. Um, it also presents some challenges, so familiarize yourself with that. And again, the big point, instrumentation data will never replace your visual observations. It only supplements them. All right. Sounds great. Well, thank you, everybody.